when she was born, um, before she was taken away to go into my more checkups, um, I did notice when I tried to nurse her that there was not very much suction and I had nursed other babies and so I realized that it, it should have been more of a, a pinching kind of pain but it, it wasn't like that. She didn't seem to be getting very much suction but I just thought that was her. And so then um, when she was, a doctor came back later on and um, when she was five hours old and um, told me that they discovered that um, she had been born with a cleft palate. Now, it was not noticed right away because it wasn't, didn't seem like a very big thing. It's not any bigger than your thumbnail, a little arrow-shaped opening at where the uvula should be. Um, but um, it, it set up a whole range of issues. Uh, I was directed to speak with Marsha Lavokin, who was uh, for the New Hampshire State uh, cleft palate and cleft lip and palate coordinator, and she was very helpful. Uh, it was a very helpful program. Uh, she was going to need, the first thing was um, a special uh, baby bottle. Um, I tried to express, express the milk uh, myself to f feed her, but it just, the milk production just wasn't stimulated enough. Um, and so she had special flexible um, baby bottles to feed her with and you uh, you couldn't like look away while you were feeding the baby because if you looked away and weren't paying attention you might be squeezing and all of a sudden it would come up through her nose so it was always the eating was always an issue um, and the cleft palate association stayed intact for a long time which was very good um, I, there were a lot of resources available to us that um, I knew that Janie was going to need speech therapy that um, she was eventually going to need the orthodontic care they were uh, able to make referrals that were very helpful um, at that time and um, uh, the, the speech, of course, that, that was always an issue, her hypernasality in her speech. The, the other issue was um, that the ear, uh, she needed to get tubes put in her ears. So when she had the surgery, the, the first surgery at age one, because they, they wait until they're big enough before they're just starting to speak, but they want to let them get as big as they can. Uh, before they do have a surgery, so it, it typically occurs at around the age of one. Uh, she had that and at the same time she had tubes put in her ears because um, the, the sound, if they can't hear right, then it's harder for them to start to speak right um, because of the fluid in, in their ears. When Jane was born, a lot of, of the issue was also, it depended how she grew. Um, and it was something that we knew that needed to be monitored. The, the malocclusion um, that occurred was, wasn't readily apparent at the time, but at, as she grew, and, and I suppose that's often the case with these kind of cases, um, that um, they, they will end up wanting to get the, the jaw surgery as well because of uh, the um, underbite. And you, there is a need for the surgery, the jaw surgery, because it, it doesn't just affect the speech. It also, she, her ability to eat, she, she couldn't chew properly. It, she would be, the, the, the top and the bottom teeth don't hit. So, I mean, it's just difficult to eat. It's difficult to speak. It's, and the appearance is another issue. Self-esteem is another issue that is always involved with that. And uh, after you, you know, take all the steps, um, everything looks really good now. <laughs>